that's the mantra. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Relationship Talk After Dark. My name is Sharonda Parker, and I am your host. And tonight's topic is, what does HIV look like? I hope you all are ready for a great show because we are ready to give you a great show. Before we get started, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Tell someone about the channel. What we're doing is we're trying to educate, we're trying to empower, we're trying to impact. So you don't want to keep this type of information to yourself. You want to make sure that you share it. Tonight we have Mr. Marvin Anderson here at the, uh, at the store doing this live interview with me. Uh, the name of his organization is Stigmocracy. Yeah. So yeah, you got it right. I got it right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, come on, introduce yourself. Tell me about who Marvin Anderson is. Well, and first of all, I want the audience to know that, we're, like, well, this is a whole studio. They got cameras everywhere here. <laughs> and so you're like, we're in the store. No, we're in the studio. Mm -hmm. Number one. And number two, like, I was late and I came in and she was like, you got two minutes. And I was like, what? <laughs> so, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, I am Marvin Anderson. I am a community advocate. Um, I'm from Baton Rouge. Okay. Um, and I do um, HIV advocacy work as well as consulting work. And, um, so yeah, so I, I mean, I, I perhaps you know throughout the interview, um, through the conversation, you probably learn more about me. I have different layers. I'm not one perspective. So you know. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, the name of the organization is Stigmocracy. Yes. What made you start Stigmocracy? Um, so um, years ago, I was diagnosed with HIV, and um, it was a really compound uh, process for me even to go through accepting it um, mm -hmm. and dealing with it. Um, and so, but the name Stigmocracy came about because I experienced stigma. And so um, I had an incident where I experienced stigma um, from my health, um, the place where I per, um, received my health care. And, um, and, and I kind of had to stand up and um, try to make sure that that doesn't happen to people like me. Um, beyond the situation with me and so um, after that I realized okay there's a work for me to do um, beyond just showing up and so um, stigmocracy, stigmocracy was formed um, to raise up an army um, and a community and a, a body of advocates and individuals and allies and ambassadors that would stand up against um, stigma against HIV in our community. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know that you are a public health advocate and consultant. So exactly what does that consist of? Because those are two different titles. Yeah. Public ad, public health advocate. Yeah. Pub public health consultant. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say they're, they're kind of one and the same. Mm -hmm. um, but specifically, if you talk about advocating, you're talking about um, standing in the gap of yourself or individuals like yourself or a cause or a purpose. Mm -hmm. And so you're advocating on behalf of it or a specified skill or, um, or service that you bring um, that you can to provide to build community mm -hmm. in a certain area and, and you're paid for it. And so, gotcha. um, so okay. yes, I operate on, on kind of both sides of the um, table. Okay. So tell me about the community that you represent. Okay. Um, so I guess I represent a lot, you know, okay. um, I'm a black man, mm -hmm. as we can see, I ain't, you know, and, um, I, I'm a gay black man. Okay. Um, I'm a gay black man that loves the Lord. Okay. Um, I'm a gay black man that's, you know, was licensed and ordained and, um, I'm a business owner. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the things that I like, enjoy that you do here with your show is you, like you provide, um, lifestyle through different lenses without judgment and so um and so i will be one of those individuals that i don't there's no specified place where i find myself um i um i represent a collective mm -hmm. um of community so yeah okay all right so um you know of course i did the pre-interview with you and um i do a lot with sex and religion and yeah. then you know talking with you <laughs> Uh, you uh, have a um, a passion with faith based and HIV, and um, we're dealing with the Bible Belt and so many. So a lot of times, um, what we do kind of overlaps a little bit, yeah. and a lot of times people don't realize it. But you know, even in my line of work, it's a certain health component to it, right? So um, when I look at HIV. I look at it from a different lens because I think I'm so accustomed to 
dealing with so many different people from so many different walks of life. Yeah. And I understand that it's not a death sentence, but that comes from education, right? Absolutely. What are some of the stigmas that people associate with HIV that um, not necessarily that you've experienced, but just from you doing a collect, you know, collective of work? What are some of the things that that you try to uh, advocate against, in other words? Um, well, first and foremost, I'm glad, you know, in your um, summation, when we were just talking about um, faith in mm-hmm. HIV, the church in HIV, um, and let's, let's start with that parallel. Okay. Right? So even being in the Bible Belt. Um, so let me just say this, that in the South or the Deep South, that consists of, you know, the states of Texas, Mississippi, um, Louisiana, Arkansas, Florida. So in the Deep South, mm-hmm. right? Um, people of color, or specifically black people, make up 54% of new diagnoses, okay? Mm -hmm. 54%, like right now today. However, black people only make up 20, like 22% of the population. Mm -hmm. That's problematic. That's almost triple in number. Why does that happen? Because in the Bible Belt, HIV is looked upon as a, as a, um, as a morality issue mm-hmm. and it's not looked at as a health issue mm-hmm. and that's that's crazy but and it's not the truth mm-hmm. you know hiv is a health issue it's a it's, it's an it's a health issue and it's an epidemic that is impacting individuals in this moment beyond a man beyond a gay man beyond a gay black man it is now actually impacting black women mm-hmm. right? our numbers on the rise yeah, on the yeah. rise um quickly you mm-hmm. know what i'm saying and so um I think that's one of the things, you know, mm-hmm. that we must understand that HIV is not a moral issue. It is a health issue. Mm-hmm. It impacts all bodies in our community. That's number one. Number two, um, we, be- we believe that HIV has a look or it has a it has a favorite, you mm-hmm. know, the gays over there you mm-hmm. know, or the alphabet people over there um, or or the promis- promiscuous person mm-hmm. or the, the person who has risky sexual behaviors. Well, what's what's promiscuous? Mm-hmm. Right. What's risky. And so um, those are like some of the top myths um, that I think are out there um, that perpetuate stigma um, mm-hmm. in our community, specifically in the South and the Bible Belt, which is where I focus my work, because that's where the problem is. OK, yeah. let me say this. Um, a few years ago, before COVID, mm-hmm. um, my pastor um, wanted to do a block party. OK. And she was like, okay, Sharonda, organize this black party. And I'm like, all right, let's do it. Let me call up all my people that I know. So I'm calling like the library. Come bring the bookmobile. I'm yeah. calling like, you know, Metro Health. Hey, come bring your um your it's mobile unit. Uh huh. <laughs> come bring your mobile unit to do um testing. And you know, I had people doing blood pressure checks. Like, you know, with when you're doing the um mobile unit for testing, they testing beyond HIV, they testing for all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. And you know, the way we did it was if you went and got tested, you got a ticket and you were able to win have a, a better chance of winning more door prizes. Nice. That was kind of the way that, you know, it was done. And the people from Metro Health said they had never been to a faith based event where so many People, especially church folks, were willing to come in and get tested because the thing is, normally people will be ashamed to get tested and be like, well, what they got to go over there to that station for? Mm -hmm. What they going in that van for if you ain't doing nothing and if you're only being intimate with your spouse and if you're not living a high risk lifestyle, you need high risk. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel like you need to get tested? And the thing was, we had so many people that were tested, that found out their status, got blood pressure checked, you know, just all kind of stuff yeah. we had done. But it, it it just amazed me that you mean to tell me that they y'all have been to other faith based organizations and people just were afraid to go get tested because you didn't want to be labeled mm-hmm. as doing things that you weren't supposed to do, you know, on, on your own free time. Right. I think one of the things probably the success had a lot to do with the leadership of that church. To mm-hmm. be quite honest, I think when, you know, I think sometimes um, bad patterns or belief systems or systemic systems are perpetuated through the messaging in the church. Mm. So, for an example, when you have a leader that um, preaches a non-judgment um, doctrine, mm-hmm. um, non-stigmatizing doctrine, so the people who make up that community are less likely to 
um, carried that same spirit. Right, mm -hmm. we call it, we call everything a spirit in the church. Oh, so of course. Church All right, shout out to Bridget. <laughs> uh, shout out to Pastor Bridget Stein. What's up, Pastor Stein? That's my girl. That's my girl. Because so, you know, like you said, a yeah. lot of times it does have to do with leadership. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So, so if so if that's the environment you live in, or that you that you minister, or that you preach, then people. So, I know um, Pastor Stein. Like you know, she's a, she's my friend, and 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 I know her, and I know how she feels about community and people in general, mm -hmm. right? And so and so with that being said. Um, you know, there, there are probably some other ministries that, that people will go to that would not be tested, mm. um, because of, um, the air or, or the misogyny or the misogynistic or the patriarchal or systemic, um, vibe that they have going gotcha. on. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, I noticed that you said, um, about the HIV having a look. I want to talk about that stigma. Okay. Um, because I'm going to just say this here, um, back in the early nineties, mm -hmm. when there wasn't a lot of medication and all of this, I watched my father die, which it transferred to actually AIDS, Right. but because of the, they didn't have all the treatment and stuff and it really had a look, mm -hmm. it was scary. It was, um, lesions all over the body. It was like literally watching the skin deteriorate. It, it had yeah. a very scary harsh look and I specifically remember because you know a lot of times when I do the pre-interviews a lot of times it caused me to reflect and I remember my mom telling me when I went to visit my grandparents don't drink out no glass paper cups paper plates paper you know and it was just like man I'm just sitting up here thinking about man and it was because people were ignorant and they didn't know so I, I clearly remember being a child and like feeling like oh I couldn't eat off this a, a, a plate that he had eaten off of mm -hmm. because I could possibly contract this. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? I do. Um, can you believe in 2022? You know, in some rural areas and some areas that are not exposed to knowledge and, you know, platforms like this, mm -hmm. there are still people mm -hmm. that have family members eat off of paper plates and paper cups. Um, you know, and before the pandemic, I think of 2018, 2019, I've traveled to over... 20 something cities across the deep south um, doing trainings and facilitations about um, stigma and how do we combat stigma, more specifically internalized stigma about how people living with HIV feel about themselves internally based upon what they're experiencing externally, right? Mm. And so a lot of those people in those trainings would just break down because they're in environments and families and, and communities that just don't get it. Mm. And um, so, I'm glad you so one of them, in, in a few of those, there are still people that are like, that's your set over there. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Let, let me say this, because even right now today, we have family members who are living with HIV, who are thriving, doing well. That's and, what we and, do. And one of our family members <laughs> is a great cook. When mm -hmm. I say a great cook, great cook. Mm -hmm. And when, when he found out that he was positive, he's the person that cooked at all of the events. And we just kind of noticed he was stepping back like because he he kind of felt in his spirit that people wouldn't be receptive to him being over the pots but you know what my husband said if you don't get over there and, and get to cooking that food right. for us exactly. like you you know we like to eat you right. know we like your food like you're not about to do this you right. know and i think if more people and families would just love and 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 learn how to embrace people and and not um like you say uh make them feel bad about Something that's already, you know, probably tormenting them, you know, themselves anyway. Because mm -hmm. sometimes we have what beating ourselves up, you know. Absolutely. Not only that, but I think now knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. um, knowledge is powerful, and so you know, I kind of like um, to bridge the gap and bring people together. And I think um, one way to do that is providing knowledge mm -hmm. about it, right? And so, um, because of the narrative that has been built in the South and in in the church and in and in our communities, you know, it's passed down from generation to generation. Mm. Um, and so I think, you know, providing knowledge. So I'm not, I'm not the type of advocate that's going to really bash people. Mm. Uh, I'm going to offer you um, an opportunity to be educated. Now, if you reject that or, you know, you reject it um, to continue to, take, to partake of stigmatizing and taunting people in my community, then we have a problem. But I think education is a process. And I think... People that are doing things like you, like you mm -hmm. use your platform to bring um, information to a community that 
normally would be siloed or we over here. We don't mm-hmm. need to know about that. But she was like, no, like my community, you know, needs to know about And it. I was talking about, because <laughs> see, when I, I was talking to you, I learned about communities. Mm-hmm. And you were talking about your specific community. And I said, well, wait a minute. No, my community is the one that had a problem right <laughs> yeah. now because our rates are on the rise, which is black women. And a lot of us are in relationships. And then we have this whole mentality um, especially the men in our lives, if we get tested, the men don't need to get tested because if my girl good, then I'm good. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you, you kind of see all of this different stuff. And then when I, you know, I do a lot of research during COVID, a lot of people didn't get tested. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like when they did find out, you know, things were kind of all out of whack with them mm-hmm. and, you know, they had to get back on track. But, you know, even with the medications, we're finding out there have been all kind of advancements oh, yeah. with the medication. So tell me about that. Well, um, for me, you know, first of all, I just want to, um, you know, pay homage to your dad um, and to you because it's it's individuals like him who, who went before people like myself mm-hmm. who had to go through the process of being tested and, and, and trying different medicines, you know, um, to get us to different stages where we can like myself today because of the advancements in science mm-hmm. and all of that like you know I, I wake up and take a pill each day i don't i don't take pills or anything like that um every two months i go get an injection and that's my that's my regimen let me ask you something mm-hmm. a lot of times people are confident in what they know yeah meaning you know the pill works because you've seen success over the years what made you confident to transition to the injection um Probably because as an advocate, um, I have access to some tables and some rooms and inf- information about studies and mm-hmm. research. And really, I- I'm not I'm not special. You know what I'm saying? Like if you mm-hmm. get on the computer or you see that information is really private to everybody, right? Mm-hmm. But um, I I've, I've watched, I've known people, I've been on boards and in spaces where people are tested. I mean, have gone through trials and have gone through studies, have gone through research. Mm-hmm. Um, and so just as the medication and appeal form has gone through mm-hmm. and the evidence and the research results show that um, it is a um, a, a formidable um, way of treatment and it worked and um, they validated and so for me um, it was transitioning from because uh, I lead a very a busy life and so sometimes for me it was hard to be in compliance with taking a pill each day you know, mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I'm getting up, trying to get to the gym and I'm down the street and I'm like, dog, I forgot to take my pill because I know if I come back, I'm going to forget. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one reason. Then the second reason was because, you know, I don't care how long, you know, especially if you're in this work, you know, there's a certain there's a certain cloud um, that, that can kind of come and exist knowingly or unknowingly. And so for me, you know, I wanted full control. You know, mm-hmm. I'm a black man, like gay or not, like I'm a black man. So I wanted this full authority over my life and what happens in my life. So, you know, I lost a few pounds and start working out. So it's all blood pressure medicine, right? Mm-hmm. So now I'm only taking this one pill. So now here's an opportunity for me to get rid of that. And so now I have full autonomy over like how I run my day. Mm-hmm. And I don't have to have a moment where the issue may not even be HIV. I could be going through depression by something else, but because I have to take this pill, okay, now here's another a reminder. reminder. Here's a wow. reminder that, man, you know, you know, you can't even control your health and look what you're living with. And so all of that took part in making the decision to go ahead and say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to try to, and, and it's been very successful for me. Okay, this is awesome. Yeah. So, um... Why is it important that we normalize HIV? Because, you know, again, I don't <laughs> consider myself to be the smartest person in the world, but I have went to school and, you know, you study viruses mm-hmm. and, you know, infections and you, you study all of this different stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, when I was growing up, we always understood that the cold is a virus that we don't have a cure for and all of this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, you know... And a long time ago, people used to die from it. Mm-hmm. But then we came up with all kind of medicines to help with the symptoms and all of this. So when I think about HIV, I kind of line it up parallel to the common cold. Even though I know the seriousness of it, it's still a virus that we don't have a cure for. But yet you can take these medicines to control the symptoms. So the seriousness of it is mm-hmm. being responsible and accountable for self. And taking the opportunity to, number one, get tested. Mm -hmm. Um, and to rid our you know the seriousness is the stigma you know Mm -hmm. you know back in the day when process when you're you know father in situations like that it was an epidemic Mm -hmm. but right now HIV is an epidemic 
stigma and ignorance is the epidemic. Okay. Um, ignorance is not an ugly word. It just means a lack of knowledge. Not, lack, lack of knowledge. knowledge that's right? all it means. Right. And so um, when people say things like, well, I don't want to know. Well, you should want to know. Mm-hmm. Guess what? People who have HIV who are on medications are living long as are outliving people who are not. And I think in this COVID landscape, and in this pandemic, it's got real for a lot of people, look, people. to understand the <laughs> HIV ain't that gangster. Baby, right look, there, people you know, was more scared like, of getting COVID than they were scared like, of getting like HIV. COVID is that gangster. <laughs> I mean, you know, so, um, and I think it got really real for people to understand, like, wow, you know, this is this is a situation or this is a health issue or health pandemic. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I think if we look at it through all those different lenses, I think that we see that we've made a shift. Mm-hmm. Um, in the movement, but just like I was saying, you know how we look at a cold and it's it, we think of it as nothing. Oh, it's just a cold, and mm-hmm. you know you're having a flare up right now, or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you contagious right now, right? I, I would like to see HIV get to the point where the same way we feel about the common cold. Well, to be honest, we're there, right? Because. The common cold, you can still catch a common cold. Yes, you can. You, you know, you can, you know, you get a cold, you know, your husband going to get a cold. He going to get a cold. Everybody in the house going to get one. That's right. You know, COVID, if there was, but guess what? If you get tested and you understand and you know your status, right? Mm-hmm. And if you happen to be diagnosed as positive and you get on a regimen, it is such thing as becoming undetectable. Mm-hmm. That means that you are on a regimen. That means that the virus has been suppressed. Mm-hmm. And that means that now undetectable equals untransmittable. So now, even though the antibodies may be present, the medicine is working, suppressing the virus, and I don't I cannot transmit it. So in other words, so <laughs> so the common cold person who can go spread the cold or the person with COVID can go spread COVID. I'm sitting right here right now. And you can't spread it. I cannot, you know what I'm saying? Or or a partner that I choose to sleep with, I cannot transmit the HIV because I am, I know, Mm -hmm. I've been tested, I know my status, I am on medication that is helping me to be healthy, which is now helping me to, it's powering me to help my community stay healthy and those that I, that that are my partner, you know, that are partner, yeah. Wow, this is awesome. And I think sometimes if people... Just had a way to explain it away, you know, because I think even mm-hmm. in, even in schools, right, mm-hmm. when they teaching viruses and um, you know different stuff like that, um, I don't think that people are getting the knowledge that they need to get because because if they did, then they could have a better understanding about what we're dealing with. Absolutely, right. I mean, you know, right now today we still have legislation um, that doesn't match the science mm-hmm. of HIV. You know, you have people right now that's more worried about, you know, passing laws that say don't say gay than passing laws that um, perpetuates um, destigmatized communities and making um, health um, equity available to everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and that's a part of it. It's, you know, I might even go down a rabbit hole of the systemic um, suppression and oppression um, that we deal with in our minds and even in our lives that we don't know, mm-hmm. which causes us to carry on these narratives that are really um, insufficient and invalid, mm-hmm. you know, in theory. And so, um, yeah, I, I just think that um, that we have made so many advancements in medicine and in science and, and, and that even the stigma and the, the narrative and the myths that was so long ago. They don't even, they don't even carry any credence now, mm-hmm. because of where we are with medicine. You know, I go every two months and get an injection, and that's it. Mm-hmm. That's my, that's my treatment. Right. So <laughs> let's talk about this. Um, a lot of times people don't have insurance and different things like that, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of times, the only time they go to the doctor is when they get a. Uh, have a symptom of something Mm -hmm. to say, I need to go and get something checked out. Right. Mm -hmm. If a person goes to the doctor, they don't normally test for HIV unless you ask for it. Right. Mm -hmm. So people that are uninsured, right. Yeah. What, what is available for them? Cause I know they have the testing and it's supposed to get tested and they find out that you're positive. Then what, because how do I pay for all of this? Because now I have a diagnosis. I don't have insurance. How do I how do I pay for all of this? There, um, there is so, there was funding that's provided because even though we're not in the pandemic 
or epidemic stages, we don't want to return there. And so there is funding and, you know, I, I'm an advocate, so I, I can come back stigma and I advocate for community engagement, community empowerment. Mm -hmm. But there are advocates in HIV that are on Capitol Hill advocating for health care, mm -hmm. advocating for funding. And so there's federal funding um, and organizations like Metro Health, um, like, um, you know, CARP or Out of the Box Center or um, Care South, uh, you know, or Family Services, like all of these places that are, you know, in our city and um, that you can go and you get services. And if you test positive, then there's a there's a next um, step or tier that you go to. And funding is the at the bottom, at the least, such as PrEP. Mm -hmm. So we can't have this conversation, you know, I don't want to leave out the fact that if, if you are someone who who are who find yourself in situations or circumstances where you feel like you know I want to put an extra layer of protection um, because I may have a more active sex sex life, right? Mm -hmm. Then those individuals can go get prep. Mm -hmm. Prep is a medication that will prevent you from being diagnosed or prevent you from being diagnosed diagnosed with HIV, mm -hmm. right? It's a protective, and so people can go and get prep, which you know at most of the places I just named, you can go. You don't have to have money or insurance to get it mm. done. You know, you can go get it done. You can, you can be on prep. You can take a pill every day that can prevent you from getting HIV. Some people don't know that. But mm -hmm. it's available. But it's available. It's available. Okay. Because, you, know? you know, sometimes people, everything has a, a cost component, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important that we put it out there that there are resources available. Absolutely. To be able to assist you. What about your privacy? Um, what do you mean? Because I'm going to get tested. I find out that I'm positive and then now I have to get on a regimen. Can, is this somewhere I can go to my regular primary care and go and get this? Or do I have to go to place where all of the, the HIV place for the HIV people? Okay. Um, and so because advocates like myself and other great advocates in our city as well, who are making sure that, uh, we provide safe spaces and, and places and spaces where people can go and get care without having to be afraid of being diagnosed. And there are such things called HIPAA laws, mm -hmm. and HIPAA regulations. And, you know, those of us that take the pledge to do this work, then we have to, you know, keep folks' business in confidence. I'm here today because I chose to, mm -hmm. you know, I chose to talk about my status to, to use it to um, reinforce um, health and elevation in this area. But, you know, there, there, there are places in, or protected. There are some places you can go and you can go through another entry. You can go through a back door. You can oh, go wow. through a side door. There, yeah, there's, okay. there's all kind of things. And what people don't understand is as a patient, you have a right. You have rights. Mm -hmm. You can ask for what you want. Oh, wow. Okay. You can say, I don't feel comfortable coming through the front lobby. And you don't have to. Okay. I just need somebody to know that. Like, okay. you have rights. Like, you know, healthcare, um, because of systemic systems, you know, black people and brown people, we've been told, like, you know, we, you know, uh, we just got to get it how we can. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to. We have rights. You can open your mouth mm -hmm. about your health care, you know? Wow. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> I want to get back to this last component because we are in the Bible Belt. And, yes, we are. <laughs> um, you know, we love the Lord down here. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Save, sanctify, how? We so. Can so what are some things that you think a regular average person, somebody that's watching, what can we bring to our churches, our places of worship? What is it that we can do to help with this cause, to, to help advocate, to help break down some of these barriers and stigmas within the church? Um... That is a loaded question, Saranda. Okay. I told you, didn't I tell you I was ordained? When I sat down uh -huh. here, like, I will do, I will go there on you tonight. Come on. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so the first thing I think is, you know, I'm not going to beat the church up. I'm not, I'm not coming, yeah, of course. I'm not going to come for the church, but I will say, how about this church just be the church? Mm -hmm. Be what the intention was. What people don't understand is that the church and the Bible and Jesus was a social, Jesus was the first advocate. Mm -hmm. Not Marvin. Right. Anybody else? Let me tell you how. So there's a woman who was caught in adultery, right? Mm -hmm. The woman caught in adultery, she comes out, and all of the men, no women were present. No women were present. Mm -hmm. All of the men in the city came in, they get ready to stone her, right? Jesus comes in, he stoops down, and he starts writing. He was saying, he that is without sin cast first stone. Mm -hmm. Everybody dropped their rocks, right? Mm -hmm. 
And then he asked the woman a question in the town. She wasn't supposed to be speaking. But in that moment, he advocated and gave her voice because he asked her, woman, you know, where y'all accuse us, right? She, and she spoke. She wasn't supposed to be speaking. Mm -hmm. But he advocated for her and gave her voice okay. and gave her strength. In that moment, he came in. That's what an advocate does. Mm -hmm. They intercede on behalf of somebody else. Okay. They stop volatile movements from happening. They stop suppression and oppression. And then he exposed. He brought clarity because there wasn't no women there. And if she was single, who she committed adultery with? If you're single, you can't commit adultery. You got to right. sleep with somebody who married. Uh huh. I can't get no help up here. All right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's a whole, so he over. So this is what Jesus did in that moment. Mm -hmm. He it was social justice in action. He overthrew a system right before our very eyes. Wow. He overthrew a system. So that's what the church got to do: overthrow systems of misogyny, patriarchy, judgment, isolation. That's what. So that and that's they're created on the foundation of Jesus, mm -hmm. the cornerstone, right? Right. So. That's what the church just just be the church. Just be the church. You know, just be the church. Just be the church. It's I love the way it. To put it. You know, I love it. All right, and my final question is: We have this whole theory about this risky sex, right? That means you're swinging from a chandelier, right? Uh huh. Yeah, <laughs> you're gonna hurt yourself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's risky sex? Come on now, y'all. What is what is risky sex? Yeah, that I is mean, an it, excellent question because it, if a person like myself, married woman. I'm intimate with my one husband. Do you know how many people are intimate with their one husband, but yet still contract the virus? I do. Right. I I, 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 I consult. I, I facilitate workshops with them in it, and I hear the stories a lot. Mm -hmm. What risk? There's risk of sex is you know. One of my mentors, Gina Brown. Hey, hey Gigi. Um, she, um, you know, she's like, what is risk of sex? Is it you're swinging from the chandelier? Um, because when you're talking about HIV and diagnosis and transmission and you talk about um, um, risky sex or risky behaviors first of all you can have sex one time mm -hmm. and be diagnosed or you can have sex a 50 times and be diagnosed or you can have sex a hundred times right well there that's not it's not risky sex it is it is an individual's choice and how and what they choose as a preventative measure. Hmm. There's no there's no there's no risky sex. Right. You know? Sex is sex. Right. Oh yeah, I know. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm I saying? Know. And you know, it's one thing in the Bible belt, one thing that's taboo. Nobody wanna talk about it. No. But all of us having it. Yeah. I can't get no help. Oh no, you're getting some help you know from here because this this why I come in at because you know, they, you know one thing that I know is even when I go to Vegas and I go to different places and I talk about sex and religion and this is one of the, the breakdown in the church because you have so many married people and then everybody says get married and then nobody gives you no other instructions after that. And then when you when you have questions, you're afraid to ask because it's so taboo to even talk about it. So a lot of times people are just like you say, ignorant. They spinning their wheels. They don't know. And a lot of times they're just out here doing because they can't get the information because they're afraid to ask. They're afraid. Um, they're ashamed. Mm -hmm. They bought into the system. They bought into the myth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, say people are having sex. And people think you know? that you're just supposed to know. Yeah. You get in there and figure it out. You're just supposed to know. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. That, yeah. You know, that's how, how people feel. So that's why I feel like platforms like mine is so important. Because mm -hmm. um, I do YouTube videos all week long teaching different things that people are too afraid to ask. But guess what? If you can get on YouTube and you can type it in, then guess what? Here's a video to pop up about it. Right. That way you don't have to be ashamed or afraid. Or even if they want to find out what does HIV look like, guess what? This video is going to pop up. And it's going to let you know that HIV does not have a look. It it's not a look. It's not a look. It's not a, a, a white person's disease. Black people or gay people. Let me tell you something. People really used to feel like this disease was specifically for a certain group of people. And if they contracted the disease, it was a punishment. Used to? Well. Oh, no. They still do. Okay. <laughs> they, you know I mean, that, we're working hard and, and mm -hmm. uh, we're grateful to finally um, have... Like individuals like yourself, um, when I say like yourself, meaning allies, meaning um, cisgender people or heterosexual people that lead heteronormative lives that say, hey, look, I have this platform 
and I need you to come over here. Let's partner. Let's do mm-hmm. work. Like, let's bring um, clarity. Let's bring education. Let's bring awareness mm-hmm. to my community. And because you have the information, come on over here. I'm going to share my platform with mm-hmm. you. And maybe if they see me and you sitting here, you know, talking about having a conversation and you ain't masked up and wrapped up in, you know, <laughs> swaddling clothing, then maybe they'll say, oh, okay. And then maybe they don't have to call me. But maybe, because you say, Marvin, well, what about this? Oh, I learned this. Maybe they'll call you. Mm-hmm. I don't care. I don't need You just to, want them to I get that information. I don't, I don't need the shot. Right. I got so much other stuff going on in my life that validates me. I don't, I don't need to be the leading, only go-to advocate. Right. There are other people. Alexis has been on here. You know, we, we've got Metro. We have got Car. We got Javar now. We got Miss. We got so many. You know, we got Tom. We got so many. And this is some of the people that I'm naming. But there are so many people that you can go to. Right. right? You don't have to come to me. Let me let me just pour this information to you. Then mm-hmm. let them inbox you like they be doing. Yeah, look, and ask you all a question. it's so you know funny because you know the way we met was through a third party, and it was just basically like, oh my god, I really enjoyed this interview. You weren't calling trying to get on the show at all, uh, and I was like, so when are you coming on the show? And yeah. So when are you coming on the show? <laughs> Yeah, because actually I called you actually because I've been to your studio before mm-hmm. um, with um, with. Um, um, just a JLP, just a piece. Tracy and her husband, they did a photo shoot um, for um, his birthday. For his birthday, right? And, um, and so I do a lot of um, brand client. I'm, they're one of my clients. I do a lot of branding work and stuff too. Mm-hmm. So I do that for them. And then I was like, yeah, like I was like, I just want to thank her because Alexis um, is a woman of trans experience who is my sister, um, um, who's loyal to me, and we, we're in this work together. And I was just like so elated. Um, that you would share your platform, mm-hmm. you know, with someone from our community. And I so really, I just really call and just thank you and say thank you. And I, you know, I'm thanking you again for, for this opportunity um, because it's needed. This is how we do it. And look at God. You know, you this just work it on. I, this is how <laughs> we do it because, you know, some of these people like, you know, I leave, I, I leave Monday to go to, to a conference. It talks about HIV and the science and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Guess what? People who watch in here, they ain't going. Right. They're not going to be there. Right, right, and so we need people like you. Um, so, and, you know, and other, if you're watching and you have a platform and you have a, a community of people that you lead that looks different than what supposed what HIV supposed to look like, mm-hmm. we need you all to come and say, "Hey, come over here. Let's mm-hmm. partner. Let's share our story." And so, right. I thank you then. I'm gonna thank you now. You know, for giving us an avenue um, and a platform to share this message and this knowledge, so that we can put a greater dent mm-hmm. um, and, and at some point in the HIV epidemic. Okay. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming on. I, you have given us a wealth <laughs> of knowledge. You all, I want to encourage you all to go get tested. Um, we have so many places here in Baton Rouge. Um, I put Marvin's uh, Instagram information on there. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can go to his page and yeah. get all types of information about testing and all of this kind of stuff. It's important that we get tested on a regular basis, you all. Go and get your um, annual visits. All of that is great. But, you know, they have different testing locations all week long, yeah. different places that you can go. And, you know, I always encourage my people. They'll even come to you now. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, I see. Now, that's something new. I didn't even know that. But you know, I encourage my ladies, especially when they get into these new these these new things, these new flings, go on a, a date to the clinic. Put it right okay. there. Go 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 on a date. Like go if you know when y'all feel like y'all getting to that that place where y'all wanna you know give yourselves to each other. Go get the go get the paperwork done and, and make sure everything all right. That way you can enjoy the moment mm-hmm. without having things going on in the back of your mind because right. you don't really know what all this person got going on so i always encourage people let, let one of your dates be to the clinic you know going out to eat and going to the walk on the level all that's great but when you feel like because trust me as women we know we know when we're gonna get that thing up <laughs> so when you Do know, soup. yeah, everybody, look, know when they try every, to get everybody know. Everybody know when they trying to get them a list song. So when you know that you know, Church you people too. Uh, of Stop course, them. Stop uh, them on the main ones. <laughs> <laughs> but when you know that you've reached that, you know that place, 
Go on a date to the clinic. Schedule you an appointment. Schedule an appointment. Yeah. Call the clinic. Ask the clinic, you know, could you come by? Could you do a yeah. house call? You know, yeah, in other words, me. like we we just find out you can do house calls and all that. So in other words, make this a, make this a priority. Make it make it important. We all should know our status. It's too much information out here today for us not to know. Okay? Mm -hmm. But um I hope you all enjoyed this video, this live. I I hope y'all got this knowledge, this education. I need you all to like, share, and subscribe. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you again for coming and being my guest. My pleasure. Look, catch me next week. We have another guest. We're going to be talking about swinging and domestic violence, y'all. It's going to be some juicy. Y'all don't want to miss it. Uh, make sure you like, share, subscribe, and join the channel. You all be blessed and enjoy the rest of your evening.